Hello, how are we doing? Good. Good. A couple of your answers. I don't ask rhetorical questions, so I appreciate that. So I'm really excited today. I'm about to start my semester. I know that I'm going to have lots of student issues and lots of student concerns coming up. And I'm already a little bit nervous because I know what last semester looked like. So what we decided to do to alleviate both my anxiety and potentially yours is bring in three people who are going to tell you how to make all of that better. And in reality, they're not going to tell you how to make it all that better, but they're going to start the conversation and tell you where you can get those resources when those things happen in our class and with our students that we don't know how to deal with. I should have probably started by introducing myself, but I know so many of you. My name is Don Saucy. I'm the Associate Director of the Teaching and Learning Center, and I'm very, very happy to give you some of my colleagues' advice about how to handle student issues and concerns as our first professional development event. I'm just bringing some up. So without further ado, thank you very much. Thank you. Is this good? You hear this? Yeah. yeah. Uh, this is for the camera, not for you all. This is by the mic. Um, uh, my name is Andy Thompson. I am the Senior Assistant Dean in the Office of Student Life and Director of Community Standards. Um, we've actually got myself and then Dr. Camilla Roberts and Dr. Jason Maceberg Tomlinson. I don't get the doctor title because I'm not done yet. Um, and, and we're here to, to tackle from that student life perspective as well as then to get a little more specific into the honor integrity violations you might uh, potentially encounter and then into the student access um, world and so we're our hope is that our sections on the actual presentation about 10 12 minutes each and then to really give us an opportunity for questions that you all may have um, we thank you for coming we are kind of like in the air about how many folks might be joining us today so um, Jason won he hit it on the head he hit the exact number so um, as we're presenting, absolutely, let's have a conversation. Ask those questions, but at the end, we're going to have lots of time for us to be able to have that discussion, okay? So I, to get started, the Office of Student Life, that's our mission statement up there. Um, my really fancy way of breaking that down is we're here to help students that are having difficult times and to make that not be so difficult for them. Um, and we rely very, very heavily on you all as faculty, staff, instructors um, in helping your students. And we will send you emails and we will say, hey, something's going on with your student. Can you help provide them some assistance and, and help it not be so bad for them? Knowing that that's a pretty vague request, right? Because it looks very different for every instructor in every class. And we know that and recognize that. But our goal is to try to help minimize the impact, the negative impacts on our students. Uh, within our office, there's five professional staff members um, that work with student issues. Um, Heather, Justin, Laurel, and myself are deans in the office, and we break our workload out by uh, particular academic colleges. So our hope with doing that is to be able to build relationships with um, the advisors, the faculty, the staff within those colleges so that we get to be more on a first name basis and we can call up and say, hey, I know I've worked with you in the past. This is what's going on for this student. We can build on those established relationships as we're helping our students. Carolyn Jones is our student life coordinator in the office who specializes in our student of concern process, which we'll touch on in a little bit and will be a very good resource for you all um, within your environments when you have issues going on with students. Some quick facts about our office. We, this past academic year, we served over 3,600 students in the office, um, ranging from really simple absence verifications all the way to really complicated um, issues um, for our students. That student of concern reporting number I want to take a second on. Um, last academic year, we had 690 student of concern reports. Okay, So how do we define a student of concern report? We define that as somebody else puts that student on our radar. So a student comes up to you and says, XYZ is going on for me, I'm struggling, or I'm going to have to be absent, and you turn around and you submit a student of concern report to us so we can proactively reach out to that student so we can help them in that broader context, just not just within your classroom. Or a student stops going to class, or you aren't able to get a hold of them for a couple weeks and you're concerned about their well-being, we'll do the proactive outreach to that student. The other set of students, they proactively come to us, so we don't label them as that student of concern piece. So we did 690 of those last school year. Just this past fall, the one that just got done, we did 526. Okay, so we'll easily clear about 800 by the time we get the, the spring semester done. For some context, two years ago, our entire student concern number was 407. 
So we are definitely trending upward in terms of our student of concerns that are being reported to us. Now, do I believe that is that way because our students are having more issues? No, I believe it's trending that way because as a campus community, we're doing a better job paying attention to the student issues that we're facing. We're doing a better job of saying, mental health is a real problem. And we, and we need to intervene in that earlier on. And it's not about just sucking it up. It's not about just deal with it and get out of bed. It's about, we gotta get you connected to those right resources. I'm gonna help you do that. So I don't know where we plateau. I know 526 is a whole lot for our office to kind of take on. Um, thank, thankfully, I have Carolyn who does all the initial outreach for those. But I thank you all for the reports. I think it's important for us to see that. I don't think anyone in this room would be surprised to know that those numbers are trending in that, that upper fashion. So one of the, the things is how do we recognize our students that, um, in need or our students in crisis that, that might need to be issued as a student of concern? For me, this really comes down to you all just paying attention, right? I think it's building on those relationships in your classroom. So was that student on time at the beginning of the semester? What was their appearance? What was the quality of the work product they were putting forward? Are those things shifting now? You know, and all of a sudden they're not coming as often. And we know some of that can waver, but it is, is it a more drastic kind of drop in attendance than it had been? Is that appearance getting outside of that freshman scruffy beard, but into truly not taking care of themselves and not, not treating themselves well? Is it taking the time in your class to truly build those relationships so then they feel open and trusting to come and have that conversation with you to say, no, it's not going great for me. The other thing is some of you teach large lectures. What's the grade book telling you? You know, if you take attendance every day and they were showing up and now all of a sudden they have two weeks of absences, that's probably telling you something. If their work product was really done well and now it's starting to kind of bottom out a little bit, that could be telling you something. You send them an email and they're not responsive. Those are the moments when I want you to say, hey, I'm gonna turn in a student of concern or send that email or pick up the phone and call Student Life to check in and say, could you all check in with that student? Because it could be that Don's already reached out to me and I go, great, now I've got Don and Mitzi both letting me know something's going on for this student, right? That starts to let us know we've got an issue here. So what I hope you take away today is pay attention and then refer right? Reach out, make those referrals. You don't have to be the expert to do it alone. Like we all do this in a team approach. Other questions about that or tips from other people in the room? I have a question. Yep. Um, if we do submit a report and I was told I get like a confirmation I never did and then I never heard anything back, is that normal? Depends on when I know the report you submitted. Okay. Um, so the question was, if she never got a confirmation back that the report came in or that we did some follow-up pieces. If you don't hear back, call us, right? I will tell you when yours came in, um, because I looked at that one. Um, it's just kind of a creature of timing of the semester and that, that wasn't super awesome. So I apologize for that. Call us and ask, and ask to talk to Karen or ask to talk to one of the deans and we'll take a look at that and go, yep, we did close, close that loop and that's our fault that we didn't shoot back to you or update you where that's at. On the same token, if you submit a report to haven't had a student reach out to me and then all of a sudden later that afternoon they do reach back out to you, give us a holler and say, oh, that student actually has gotten back in touch with me because that changes our response a little bit. So our hope, and I think we did better last semester, is to close the loop better with the reporting parties. Um, and, and we did that better, but obviously not perfectly. So our hope is to close that loop. But just call or holler if we don't close that loop. Good. What are the actions that are taken following our report? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, when you submit a student concern report, we, we have them listed as um, like low, intermediate, and high. Okay. So in low and intermediate cases, it's, it's through a system called Maxian. The automated response will go to Carolyn, the email. will go to Carolyn and then whatever dean is on call at. Okay, so like this week it's me. So any student concern report that comes in, I get a copy of that email. On those reports, Carolyn reviews all of them. And if it's just kind of like, okay, we need to address this and take a look at this, start reaching out to the student, we will send an email that same day to the student. And in our system, we can see if the student opens the email or not. Like we can tell exactly from where they opened it, what time they opened it. Um, 
So then if they don't open their email within a day, we do a regular email follow-up in addition to another system email. And then we'll just do a phone call to the student, okay? That's kind of on your baseline. We're not worried about health and safety stuff. It's just kind of like we gotta catch them because they're starting to slide. If you do a high one, so we're talking health and safety issues that are major issues, that actually gets connected to everybody in our office. We all get notified on that. And that may be, uh, we're gonna make a phone call right away. That may be uh, if they're in housing and dining, we call housing and dining and say, hey, can you go knock on their door? Um, if it's mental health and, and physical safety health, we may do a, a welfare check with campus police or the community police. Um, it just kind of depends on what you're, what you're reporting, but we're gonna try to make contact one way or the other within that same day that we get the report. Obviously, if you do an SOC at eight o'clock at night, it's not going out that night. And if it's a high one at eight o'clock at night, that's where you call our office. We're answer 24 seven, 365. We have a, an after hours number or a dean on call at all times for that. That's good. Do you have a question? The question is like, if there's a student, so I had one student last semester who was coming to class on the job, a couple of times changed habits with surgery and stuff, gone for a while, and toward the end, showed up a couple of times, met with me pretty much right before the end of the semester saying that she was working with the student's life, there were issues happening, but I never got an email from the student's life. So is it okay to call? Yes. Like, would yes. you know, it, it's not like a protective thing, nope. right? No, no, great, good point. Um, so just so everybody on the video can hear, um, the question is kind of a student that was, was coming, going, maybe had surgery and some personal things going on, the student shows up later in the semester, says she's working with student life, and that student life might be in, in contact. You can absolutely call and double check that with us, right? And we can tell you, yep, yep, they've come in. Um, we're gonna send the email out, or, you know, we work on documentation. So if a student comes in and says something's going on, yeah, they may have sat down with me, but we're waiting on their doctor to get me a note to say, yeah, they did have surgery that required two weeks notice or their mental health provider or whatever. And even in that case, then I can say to you, yes, they've come in, I'm going to get you an email. I, we just don't, we're not gonna send a lot of emails out without that backing, because I need you to know that we've done our due diligence to confirm that what that student says is going on is actually what's going on, so that you don't have to double check that or, or doubt that in the back of your, your mind. So yeah, absolutely, call us, yep. So assisting that student crisis, I, I, I touched on several parts of this already, but uh, building on your established relationship, you know, paying attention, relate your observations to us, to that student, normalize the help. I can't tell you how many students I sit down with and I say, you know what, you're feeling what you're going through like that? Absolutely, that's natural. And to just watch a student, like the pressure come off of them to be like, oh good. It's normal and take a deep breath. And then it changes the whole game and how we can help and help them out, right? Because I think we, we build ourselves up that we have to be invincible and that we can just kind of pile, you know, just pile drive right through this. And we all know that that's not how life works, right? Like life is about using your resources. Um, for you all, make the referrals, whether that's your dean's office, it's talking to your department head, it's talking to fellow, it's other colleagues, it's calling us, it's knowing that counseling services is available for our students and the family center is available to our students. Um, it's the care office, which we'll get into. If you have a student, you know they live in housing and dining. Housing and dining has 150 RAs that they train for three weeks every semester to help students and grad students and full-time staff members. So asking those questions so you can kind of get an idea and just being like, hey, I think you should talk to housing. I think you should go to Student Life. Or do you mind if I submit a report to Student Life so that you can help get connected? If a student has opened up to you, they're ready. Right? Like they're, they're reaching their hand out. You just got to grab it and help kind of get them to that next step. Yep. So if I'm referring a student, are they going to be told that it was me referring? Great. So the question is, will the student be told who's referring? On our student of concern report, there's actually a button at the bottom where it says, can we tell the student that you refer? And it's, yeah, absolutely, no way, or if necessary. Right? Now I will tell you, if you're the only one on campus the student has told it to, they're probably gonna to put two and two together that you made the referral, right? And so if they've come to you and you know it's something you can't keep or shouldn't keep or you need help, I think it's a, I would say tell the student that you're gonna make that referral. Like I think that's appropriate. 
that helps keep that trust there. Um, if I get those reports where it's like absolutely not, I will try to dodge around that a little bit. But there are times where I'm just like, the student's like, it was so and so, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. But they did it because they want to help you, right? They don't want you to continue to kind of struggle along those ways. I mean, that last bullet I don't want to miss, right? You all need to take care of yourselves, right? Life gets busy. We have our own mental health, our own financial struggles, our own relationship things, our own family health issues. So make sure you take care of yourself. So as a graduate student, is this something that we consider, or do we need to do that through like your supervising faculty? Uh, from my perspective, anyone can submit. I think as a graduate student, it's good to keep your, like whoever your supervisor is or what that relationship looks like in the loop. But, I mean, and I, and I think you have to have that discussion with that person. Because, I mean, I have some grad students that it's very close, closely aligned with whoever is in charge. And that others are like, nope, do it, it's your class, take care of it. So have that discussion, but for me, anyone can take it. Anyone can submit. Um, this is just some resources for everybody. That's our number, 24-7-365. That's our website where you can find our Student of Concern reporting form. The other website where you can find a lot of forms that you need to submit if you have concerns is just the um, backslash report, where that's where you're going to find you can submit your student concern reports, code of conduct violations, honor integrity violations, um, office institutional equity. Um, that's, and that's going to have a ton of resources too. So backslash student life or backslash report is going to get you a lot of the resources you're needing when you're talking about students in need. Some mandated reporting pieces that I want to make sure we touch on. Um, nobody in this room is a confidential source. So if a student comes to you with anything around sexual violence, sexual harassment, dating, domestic violence, stalking, and says, hey, I've got something to tell you, I don't want you to tell anybody, we don't get to say okay, right? We get to say, you know what? I want you to be able to tell somebody to get you to help. And I want you to be in control of that message. I'm here to support you, but I can't just keep it private. Um, if a student tells you something along those lines, we've got a file with OIE, or you can call our office to make that report. The care office is the confidential office. So if you have a student in those categories, dating, domestic, sexual violence, sexual harassment, stalking, we do have to make those reports, but care is confidential. So you can always get a student walked over to the care office. They can share that information with care. A student may be coming to you saying, I'm ready to make a report. I'm starting with you. Right? We also don't want students to have to tell their story a whole bunch. So that's where you can also call us up and say, hey, can I walk a student up to you? Or call OIE and say, can I walk a student over to you? Or hop on that backslash report page and just go ahead and fill that out with them in, in the moment while they're, while they're feeling empowered there, okay? Care Office, just so you know, as resources does have a care fund. So for our students that um, are survivors or secondary survivors of trauma, they have a fund that will pay for therapy for those students. Um, and that's not just on campus therapy, that can be out in the community of therapy. Is that number 24 hours? Care is not 24 hours. They do, they do get answered by the after hour service like we do, but they're not gonna have an advocate be able to respond. You'll have to use the community resources for that because um, the community resources are 24. Good question. Um, absence notifications, and Jason and Camilla said, you're not going to do this in 10 minutes, and you're way right, but I've got questions, so. Um, <laughs> absence notifications are going to be one of the primary things you'll hear from Student Life about. Um, again, it, it, it falls into that category if a student says, hey, I had surgery, or I had something going on, or I missed, where we're verifying. And if a student says, I'm going to miss your class for a week because of this, that's when you say, hey, go to Student Life, because they can help have that conversation, help send those emails to your faculty, verify that and make sure that we're covering the, the whole situation, not just that one. I think one of the things where sometimes students don't fully understand, and this is not their fault, is it's not that crisis or that hurt isn't just about the right now, right? Like we can resolve the issue in the right now, but it's how it, the ripples of that hurt, right? So what's it look like a week from now, two weeks from now, three months from now, when we haven't taken care of the right now, which is why I think it's so important to connect in the moment with the resources so we can keep that ripple from getting too big and too, too hurting too much, okay? So if you get something from us, again, call us, ask the question.
we may send you one. It's called, we call it our general concern email. And I, Don and I talked about it when I presented one of these last semester. And it's, it's very vague. It's a student has been dealing with a variety of personal issues over the last two weeks, four weeks, and hasn't been able to focus on their academics. But they want to talk with you about what it will look like in your class to get caught back up. And talk about wide open. Nowhere in there will it say it actually specifically says the student will reach out to you and it's up to you what that looks like. And that's okay. We tell the student that. That email is sent with the hope of with the hope of opening the door to conversation. And sometimes the help is we just can't do it this semester. But maybe that maybe that email help opens the door to an incomplete, right? Maybe it opens the door to no, but I think I would support a withdrawal. <coughs> great. That's great. I'm not saying that you've got to work with the student and get them an A, right? Sometimes it's about I can give you half credit on everything you missed for those four weeks, and that's going to get you just over the passing mark. Maybe that's enough, right? It's just to open the door to have that conversation, okay? And again, you can call and have that, ask those questions, have those discussions. The more faculty we talk to, the better we can help serve our students and then ultimately help serve you in serving your students. And some quick resources, and some of them are in the room. Academic Achievement Center, students can have a free academic coach. So if you, see, if you see a student that's struggling with time management or just kind of managing college, they can go get a free coach that they can meet with weekly to build some of those skills so it's no longer an issue for them. Let's catch it when they're a freshman. Let's catch it, you know, this semester so then six semesters down the road we're not dealing with the impact because they just never learned how to put something on a calendar and show up on time, right? Um, the Fiend Health Center, <laughs> full medical facility, um, Students, to me, let's transfer your care to, to campus. Instead of having to drive three hours home to go see your doctor, you've got one right here on campus. Student Access Center, Jason's gonna get on um, the mic here in a couple minutes. Um, financial assistance, college is expensive. Have them come see us, we can see what we can do to help get them connected, okay? Counseling services, four free sessions. Again, I think normalizing uh, the help in, in, in mental health care we've touched on legal services just so you know students have already paid for an attorney on campus her name is sarah Barr. she's in student life so if you have a student that says i got an mip i'm really stressed out i don't know what's going to happen in the court system they don't need to be stressed out have them come see sarah for free she can talk through what's going to happen in the court system if they have a landlord that's not being super great and, and cooperating they can meet with sarah for that if they have leases they're concerned about we also have an off-campus housing support person in the office of student life to talk about off-campus stuff Powercat Financial Counseling, again, with the financial stuff. And then CATS covered. Like 36, 38% of students say they skip a meal because they can't afford it. Like that's an outrageous number, but it's, it's our reality. So CATS covered, no questions asked. Come in, get your food, you can go as often as you want. Questions? Actually, no questions. Jason, you're up. <laughs> <laughs> I took out like four slides. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Hello, how y'all doing? I'm Jason Maysburg Tomlinson. I direct the Student Access Center on campus. And I want to echo a lot of what Andy said in regards to our community working together. In fact, we're right across the hall from Office of Student Life. And we partner up on a lot of details. You know, when a student concern comes out, in fact, I've had students do student concern reports on other students because they're worried about a classmate. You know, and it may be a person with a disability, we'll connect. We want to make sure to help that student to the best we can. We bring in resources as needed. There we go. Our mission, you know, it's summed up in regards to we collaborate with the community. We're here to make sure students have access to programs on campus and that's accessible programs on campus. Can I ensure that it's all done? No. We're here to focus on the student and primarily letters of accommodation that go to the classroom, academic accommodations, housing accommodations, and a little bit with transportation. But we're here to advocate for the student. And so if a student's involved in court, uh, committees on campus and other work on campus, we're gonna work with them to help them understand how to make their services accessible. You may have gone to large events and seen interpreters. We have interpreters who go out to help make those events accessible to our students with disabilities. It's programmatic access. But a lot of what we do is through work with each other. Uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act calls it the interactive process. And that's really kind of our focus. And that's what we champion, because we can't do it alone. Nobody can. Um, as we go through, though, you know, one piece, 
When I say disability, I should preface this because a lot of people, do you think of a condition, a certain condition, a certain set of conditions? I want to kind of open this up to thinking about how the Americans with Disabilities Act frames disability. It's a substantial limitation to a major life event. And so it's not always just about kind of stereotypical disabilities, the visible disabilities, somebody who's blind, somebody who's deaf, somebody who uses a wheelchair. It's also mental health and visible disabilities. It's also a matter of other things that come up. Some things may be temporary. We work with students with temporary conditions as well. Um, but it's not just about the condition, it's how that condition affects their performance, their ability to access programs here at Kansas State University. And it can be tricky because somebody will say, well, what diagnosis would get me accommodations? Well, it's not about the diagnosis. It's about much more than that. And it's about interacting with the student. I would say there's a case of the hiccups in England. It's been a long time ago. Where somebody had the hiccups for like five years. One day, yeah, it's the hiccups. Five years, that's painful. That affects their ability to interact in daily behavior. That becomes a disabling condition for hiccups. So this is our office. Like the Office of Student Life, we're also organized a lot by colleges. Uh, we have myself and Ann Pierce, who is my assistant director. Natalie Bahari is our interpreter coordinator, also an access advisor. It means working with students to set up accommodations. And Lindsay Cabina, who also is an access advisor and our outreach coordinator. The four of us work with students to go through documentation to find uh, accommodations for students and then put together letters of accommodation. We'll talk more about that. We also have Ann Collette, who is our test center assistant. For students who use accommodations during exams, we understand that this classroom may have three classes into it, and the one in the middle is where a student needs extra time. It's impossible to do the extra time in class. The professor has to teach back to back. So we have a test center there to help students and make sure they get their accommodations. Also, Wanda Cockrell, who is our senior administ administrative assistant. Like I said, we work with temporary disabilities. This little thing called ICE twists a lot of ankles, breaks a lot of knees. Students have a temporary injury. We help with a golf cart that zooms around. Uh, and she coordinates that and has a staff of students who drive that around campus. I want to talk a little bit about our accommodation process because this helps faculty and, and staff understand how we interact with students throughout. So students contact us and provide appropriate disability documentation first. And I mentioned that a lot of it is, like Andy says, documentation driven. There's a little bit of a caveat here. Thanks to the Americans with Disabilities Act, we don't have to have documentation for every student. I say that because if somebody wheels themselves into my office with a manual wheelchair and it's quite apparent, I'm going to serve that student for obvious needs. I'm not going to question their condition. If somebody's using a white cane, what's a white cane used for? What's that? Vision, Vision yes. Uh, white cane user, then I'm not gonna question that. And we're gonna work with that information the best we can. But a lot of things are invisible. 90 plus percent of the students we work with have an invisible disability. Mental health, learning disabilities, ADHD. So we have documentation to help inform us on what accommodations are gonna be appropriate. We then review that documentation or whatever is needed. We meet with the student, again, that interactive process. And we do that very deliberatively because we're gonna to put together letters of accommodation that will inform faculty on what accommodations need to be made. And we don't take that lightly. Um, in fact, if we have questions, we may consult faculty to understand how the accommodations may interact with their environment. This is appropriate because we may be working with a student who starts in their undergraduate program and they're in one program, extra time makes perfect sense, great. Years down the road, I might be working with that student in vet med or in another clinical science area where that extra time isn't appropriate in all situations because you're talking about different conditions and how it affects licensure and other aspects. So we have to look that up a little differently. Or it could be accommodations where a student needs that may alter the course instruction well, we, we're not going to fundamentally change a course, but we're going to do the best we can to make sure that student has access. And that requires us to talk to faculty. And we get to work with a lot of folks. Um, but when we go through that process, we know when we create that letter of accommodation, it's kind of our agreement with the law and accessibility, and that we have to abide by those accommodations. So we're quite serious when we write those to make sure we're very intentional in talking with the student to understand every aspect. And it's not easy. There's no science. I, I wish there was. A lot of what we provide, letters of accommodation, those go to the faculty member from the student to say, here are the accommodations that are afforded to the student for this semester, and it gives some instructions on how to do those accommodations. I'm very happy to say this is gonna be changing a little bit. Right now, students bring their accommodation letter, they email it. We're gonna to go to a system where it's automated, 
and it's sent to faculty, I'm hoping that uh, this may. Uh, we've been working on it for a while. They'll also allow the faculty to sign in to see which students have requested letters of accommodation for their course. Very big caveat, which students have requested the letters. We need to understand that when we get that information, it's confidential. It's not that the student's gonna use that same accommodation in every class. They're requesting it and it's their choice to use it in every class. I have a lot of students who are very intentional about that, who don't wanna use their accommodations in some classes. And so it's when we get the letter, when they request it. So it may not be every student who has accommodations in their office who's requesting their letters. It's up to them. Very autonomous process. Um, we have a testing center, and that's only for students with accommodations in our office. And we'll talk a little bit about numbers in a little bit. Shuttle services, we zoom around campus uh, largely. How many of you know about Adibus Park and Ride system? Okay, I need more hands. Uh, there's a system, the bus goes around campus every 10 minutes. Okay, not one. There are four buses, I think, that do that journey. It is awesome, and it has helped us out so much for those using crutches or cold. And to get from, you can hop on out outside of this office and you can go around to the union, for example, and you can avoid that nasty hill. That works a lot for students, but when you have a 10 minute gap, you can't just wait for the bus. And so students who don't use a wheelchair, uh, we hop or on a golf cart and we drive across campus. Students use wheelchairs permanently. We work with their schedule to make sure they have time between classes to get from point A to point B. Um, and so we'll work with them a little bit differently because we want to make sure students have physical access. But those students who break a leg, I tell you, that's impacting. When you get, get around life, okay, on two legs and you break a leg, that really changes your day and it makes it quite difficult. So we're there to help out. Uh, service animals, uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. And housing accommodations too. We work with a lot of housing accommodations uh, and this varies, uh, you name it. Again, it's any condition that's going to affect your life and daily living. And so we work with a lot of students to make sure they're accommodated in housing. Um, a little bit by the numbers. Uh, so you can understand how many students work with our office. The first one is how many students are registered with our office. These aren't students who have all the documentation necessarily or who have accommodations. They've touched base with our office at some point. Those who are enrolled this semester, there are 981 students who have told us that they have a disability and they may need accommodations. But that's just the start. Throughout the semester, we'll see two to three, four hundred more students come talk with our office. So it'll be much higher. The students with actual academic accommodations, it drops to about 576. Because those other students are still getting documentation, we're still talking. Some choose whether or not to disclose. They've let us know out of high school they had accommodations, but they're not sure yet if they want to use accommodations in college. And that's a very important piece because it's up to the student to declare that, they're autonomous. And that's a, that's a cultural piece too. Those of us who went through special ed and anywhere through K through 12, there's a stigma. Come to college, you wanna release that stigma. And this is their opportunity to do so. But that student can come to our office at any time and say, I need accommodations. And I really hope they do, because we're confidential with that information. We don't share with students' disability, and we only share the accommodations if they've asked for it. So it's in their control. We do that because not all students are really comfortable with being overt about their, their documentation, their accommodations, all of those pieces. So we want them to feel safe, but we also want them to succeed. We can't promise success, but we promise access. And we want to make sure they have access to do the best they can. Kind of related to what you just said, that it's in their control, that they're supposed to come to you. We can't refer them, as you mentioned, the other case, right? Or we'll talk. just had a situation yeah. on one semester with a student I think he had a problem with speech. Yeah, yeah. And I struggled a lot understanding him. Yeah. Um, he wanted to ask questions, make comments. I we tried to come really close, and then I just could not understand or hear. I asked him yeah. a few times to come sit down closer, and he refused. But yeah. it, was, it was really hard. That sure. referral process, it's delicate. Let's skip ahead to that. Because I think that's very important to focus on. I see I'm using up too much time. Um, you can see a little bit of exams and rights there. Um, so here's, well, we're going to go back. So you're suspecting a student need. And I always tell faculty, is feel free to call us. And, and we can definitely chat about that. Because we want to hear that information to help a student. If it's a student registered with our office, we take that information, we help them out the best we can. We learn a little bit more that maybe they're not aware of how it's being perceived. I always focus though on never saying, oh, I think you have a disability, 
But I always tell faculty this kind of second piece, you know, share a list of all the active resources. This happens to be one of them. We're here to help students. And sometimes students catch that, that student years ago who really didn't want to show their disability and didn't tell anybody, started to struggle. Faculty were noticing it. Um, but she got a sheet of paper. We were one of the offices listed. And she took it, didn't say anything, came straight to our office and said, I think I need help. And so that kind of gives them the power to do so, that information. But feel free to call our office. We won't say if a student's registered with our office or not, unless they either enrolled in your class and they've asked for accommodation letters. But it can help us give information and then we can talk to the student and say, you know, and I'm kind of like Andy. I may not say who called. I'll just say, you know, let's talk a little bit about this class. How are you doing in this class? And let's dig a little bit further. And, but there are times when I'll say, you know, I got a call. <laughs> and we really need to help you out in this class because I think things are uncomfortable and I want to help you succeed so we can work on your communication. Um, and we'll look at that. But you know, there are a lot of students, like I said, who don't register with our office. And so we want to make sure to also provide you with resources if they never come forward to help you feel more comfortable with the situation that you're doing a good job with communication. Yeah, that's a good question. But, you know, I would say, you know, just share a list of those offices. Um, I've talked a little bit about documentation, but one piece I want to focus on is if a student tries to bring you documentation, say, you know, that goes to the Student Access Center. They're charged with holding this documentation and they're under the ADA for arranging accommodations. Take it there. Two reasons for that. One, that documentation can have a lot of personal details in it. And I have some students who overshare by accident with some of the documentation. But it's also personal documentation, it's health documentation. We can help them out. Two, we can make a good faith effort to provide accommodations in our classroom, but we have to remember that person's here for a program. We want to make sure they have access throughout the program. And we don't want different treatment by different faculty based on somebody's perception of the documentation. So we want to kind of standardize that while they're here. Um, again, it's up to them to take part in the process. Um, but let them know that we're here to do all the uh, pieces. But then they'll bring you a letter of accommodation when we've set up the accommodations. And again, it puts that student in charge. But also remember, once you get that letter, you can't say, no, I don't think you need extra time. Or no, I perceive this, you won't, you won't have to worry about it. No, listen to the student. Listen to their concerns. Because there may be pieces that you're not thinking through uh, about that accommodation. Um, service animals, I said I'd touch upon that. I bring it up because I've had more questions about service animals in the last couple of years. I think it's because it's in the media a lot with emotional support animals as well. And frankly, I like talking about it. Um, because service animals kick butt. They're awesome. Have you ever seen a service animal at work? It's a really a wonder to see. And we have more and more service animals on campus. One common misperception though is the service animal is a guide animal. Yeah, a guide animal is a service animal, but the service animal is much more. We have a lot of service animals on campus for PTSD, uh, for veterans. We have a lot of service animals on campus to alert for blood pressure or um, blood sugar or other changes. And they're trained very well. And so respect service animals, but also know one of the misconceptions is that student will have a letter of accommodation. A service animal is one of the only accommodations that is spoke about directly by the Americans with Disabilities Act. They don't need accommodation, they're afforded access to any public place. And so, uh, but you can say, okay, is this a service animal? What work have they been trained to perform? But then send them, contact our office, but also lead with kindness. Um, don't start to question things too much, just lead with kindness and give me a call. Say, Jason, I have a question. Um, and we can talk it out and, and go through that, but also know that Oftentimes the animal's nearly as nervous as a student on the first day of class, because um, it's a it's hard adjustment. Um, we work with temporary accommodations. I'm just gonna cruise through this really quickly because uh, we're here to again, make sure that students have access, a lot of the physical access, uh, hand injuries, they happen a lot around finals weeks every year. And you gotta do your finals and we work with the program, know that we're gonna contact the department oftentimes if there's a long essay test, especially in the hard sciences, I can't do physics. And we're gonna say, can you help scribe that test so we have access for that student. Uh, we do the best we can, we'll work with faculty in the interactive process. But again, <laughs> it's helping us learn what's gonna help that student out. Because if you all of a sudden have a student, had a physics student a couple of years ago, had three exams, had an accident, injured their arm, couldn't write anything down. It's like, I don't know how we're gonna help you get that information out. When we talked about it, you realize, I don't know how I would speak it. I'm used to writing it down. I have never had to think out loud before. And so we had to come up with some unique uh, arrangements there. And it worked out really well. So that's that. 
I'm going to hand off to Camilla now, uh, next. But if you have any questions, I'll stay around afterwards as well or towards the end. Okay, hello. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I'm Camilla Roberts, uh, the Director of the Honor and Integrity System. And I told Andy to save time for questions. I'm just going to say, students cheat. Contact me. <laughs> we'll go through a little bit more. Uh, but the Honor and Integrity System is here as the office uh, to handle any academic integrity concerns for students. Um, there is a different process, and I've had questions. If a professor, a faculty member, staff member, if they are alleged to have plagiarized something, either for like a journal article, whatever, some kind of publication, that does not go through my office. There is a faculty senate um, committee that will handle those cases. Thankfully, it does not meet very often, but there is that, that office um, or going through faculty senate to handle any academic integrity concerns of faculty and staff. Um, you've noticed a lot of Holton Hall. My office is also in Holton Hall. Um, just moved there. We kind of bounce around the university a little bit, but um, we're recently there. So we are actually still in, in the office suite of the Office of Student Life. However, we do not have the same reporting structure. Um, so it's, it's a great collaboration because the Office of Student Life and myself, we have often done a lot of collaboration. Um, the Office of Student Life deans are often advocates or support persons for students who are coming through our process just to kind of be there with them. Um, because a lot of times our students, if they're coming through my process, are not getting good news. Uh, they're going to have some pretty major ramifications in terms of grades or possibly in terms of their continuation as a student. Um, I was thinking as, as uh, Jason and Andy were talking, they kept talking about documentation. Sometimes we get false documentation. And so sometimes as they are working on making sure that that documentation is correct, sometimes they actually refer information to me and actually file a report because, hey, this student decided to falsify documentation for Lafine. This student decided to falsify documentation about a, uh, a death in the family. And so that's one of the main reasons why they're saying, uh, Andy said, bring documentation to them um, because they can verify that. Many faculty members will say, well, yeah, I know you're missing class because of funeral. Can, well, can I give just a copy of the obituary? Well, student gives you a copy of the obituary, well, they falsified that. Um, so make sure that that goes through those offices because they are the ones who can verify that information. Um, so just a little very quick background. Um, we've been in existence actually since 1999, um, and it was students who wanted the honor and integrity system. And that's why when I come and talk to students, a lot of times I will tell them the story that there was actually a large cheating scandal that happened in a biology class. And that's the reason why we even have the system because students wanted to hold other students accountable. The honor and integrity system is not about faculty members out to get students. It's to make sure that the integrity of the degree is worth something. I do have a degree from K-State. I want my K-State degree, degree to be worth something. And so that is why we have that honor and integrity system in the first place. Um, this is our, our brand, and we saw it on that first slide. The idea of a family built on trust. We're all in this together. And so we have to hold other students accountable and we're hoping that our students hold each other accountable as well. It's not, it's not required to report, um, but definitely encouraged to report. We think that, of course, we're here for uh, a learning opportunity. Our students are here to learn. They're here to get a degree in most cases. But the learning lapses when there's that academic integrity violation. Um, these are the most common violations that we see, with other being the catch-all. Um, plagiarism, unauthorized collaboration, unauthorized aid, and falsification. Uh, our plagiarism and unauthorized collaboration make up about 80% of our cases that we see every year. Uh, but there are ways, now I can't remember if I have it later in my, in my slide, there are ways that you can help avoid academic integrity violations in your classroom, partially by the way you uh, Discuss academic integrity with your students. Talk to them about citation. If you are writing lots of papers and you're going to hold them accountable for plagiarism, take one class day, half a class day, and explain, this is how I want you to cite. There's so many times I do have students come to me and, and they've had an academic integrity violation. They're like, well, nobody's taught me how to cite an APA. And so if we're going to hold our students accountable, we should be teaching them. Yes, they can still be held accountable. They should have known. But if it's something that you're going to really be stressing, Talk to them about it. Unauthorized collaboration, explain what does it mean to work together with another person 
To what degree can they work together with them? Can they just discuss it in class? Um, give them examples of what, what do you feel is authorized versus unauthorized, because there's a lot of um, a misunderstanding by students. Uh, and there's a lot of gray area in that idea of co uh, collaboration, authorized versus unauthorized. We taste that the students have choices. And just as, as you have choices when you're leading a class, um, and these are some other ways that you can help avoid or maybe not have as many academic integrity violations in your classroom. Um, starting with your syllabus. On that first day of class, there's going to be information, because the provost asked you to put it in there, about the honor and integrity system. But are you skipping over that, or are you actually mentioning it and talking to your students about it to say, hey, this is important, um, and this is reason. Preparation, come to class prepared. <laughs> Just like we're asking our students to come to class prepared. Uh, and, and having that information there for students because it's, we, I tell, my, tell the students that I work with that have come through the violation that if they've had a violation, sometimes the, the professor might feel very hurt, might feel very angry because they're putting time and energy into teaching the class, just like the student should be putting that time and energy. Um, so make sure you are coming prepared. Um, just like I said, the assessments, how you make your assessments, um, I've had one of some professors come and, and they've been very shocked that a student has cheated on um, a take home exam where they said you may not use a, an outside resource, but they said you don't have to be proctored. Well, using just common sense, if you were in a situation and you had to take an exam and nobody was around you and you looked at the first question and you're like, I have no clue what this is going on. And you look around and nobody's around, you're at your house. It would take a lot of willpower for many of us to not look at a book or to not look it up on the internet when you're like, nobody will ever know. So think about how you're doing your assessments that if you are doing an open book or a take home exam, probably shouldn't be in a closed book exam or allow them to be proctored or make, or make them be proctored. Um, also, the research out there, I think in academic integrity says that if you can make your assessments I design your assessments to be more personalized or allow a student to choose maybe a different topic that might be more uh, interesting to them, then they're at least likely to have any kind of academic integrity violation because they feel committed to that assignment. They are able to choose it. Um, that doesn't mean it's not going to happen, but, but you can. Like I said earlier, it is not a requirement to report violations. However, it's highly recommended. Um, and so that's why you have the choice of discouraging academic misconduct by reporting. There are some professors on campus that are known to report more than others. We don't, we don't say on our website, we don't say in our annual report who those professors are or where those reports came from other than the college. Uh, but students learn, there's talk, and so they also know I'm not going to do anything in that class because I know I'm actually going to be going to get reported. Um, so report when you need, when, when you feel is necessary. The honor pledge, hopefully you've all seen it. If you haven't seen it, go put it on your syllabus right now before you start class next week, but it should be there. Go kind of quickly. So I talked about reporting a little bit. Um, steps to reporting. First of all, you notice a concern. You don't necessarily have to have proof. We are not a legal system, and that's a big difference between the, the honor and integrity system as, and any kind of legal. You do not have to necessarily know where they plagiarized material from. You don't necessarily have to know who did that work, but you just can, you have an inkling that that is not the same kind of work that they produced in the past. I think they got some unauthorized, unauthorized aid from that. You do have 20 class days to report. So over this winter break, anytime it's in class, it hasn't counted it. So we actually can still, I'm still receiving some reports uh, just in the past couple of days of things that happened during exam week. So actually the students, they have until almost the beginning of February to report based upon that 20 class days. Um, you are required to report if you're taking something away. Our students have a right to due process and that is our system. So if you are giving, taking something away, so if you're giving a zero or um, you're taking away half points, um, then you have, you're required to report because of that due process. Um, if you are saying, hey, I think something happened and I'm going to allow you to redo it and you can earn up all your, earn up all the points, you're not mandatory to report. However, we highly encourage because we 
keep all the records. And we can know whether that student's doing it in other, in other cases or other classes as well. And in most cases, you will decide a sanction. Um, these are some of your sanction options. Pretty much anything you can think of, almost. Uh, any kind of grade sanction, all the way to an XF, which is failure in the class because of academic dishonesty. Um, our development and integrity class is a very common sanction. It is often paired with a grade sanction. It's a one credit hour class. It, in most cases, can remove the X component of that XF. Uh, so that would then allow the student to retake the class in via violation, and the X in the long run would not go into their GPA as long as they have those still as 18 credit hours to do grade retakes. Um, we talked about this a little bit. Uh, you are not required to meet with the student. However, we highly encourage it. Hear their side. It might affect what kind of sanction you might want to give them because if they come out and they say, yeah, I, I screwed up and they really admit things, maybe you do a lesser sanction. Um, you will be copied on all the communication with the student uh, that we send out, so you'll know where in the process um, uh, they, they are. They do have that right to contest it. Um, please note, yes? So if a student says, yeah, I did that, they still have to go through the due process? And still no, so if they, choose, if they choose not to contest, it ends right then. We close the case. And we can Their sanction is fine. Yes, and then you still file it with us. Oh, okay. Yes, you file it with us still, basically so that we can keep track. Just wouldn't go through the yeah, process. they just would not go through the entire hearing process with our honor council. Yes. Can we do it internally in our program? We're an English language program. Like, if we don't always, we handle something. Right. Like and there are, the, yeah, sometimes in some programs they do, like, if, the student can always come back, if you're taking something away, the student can always come back and do a grade grievance process, and Grade grievance, the documentation within the student in the university handbook says that if it is an academic integrity concern, it'll be bounced to me and you will be forced to do something. So you're always running the risk. That's why I say it's mandatory because they can. They can. However, if you say, you know, this is a learning process, I'm going to have you redo it or do an additional assignment, but I'm going to give you the points. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's a fine line. Okay, kind of shorten a little bit because students will cheat. <laughs> um, no, and for real, they're they're even if you haven't had an academic integrity violation at some point, if you're in the classroom long enough, there will be. Um, our numbers are increasing. More and more students are buying things online. Uh, the in the realm of academic integrity, it's called contract cheating. People are buying or paying other people to do their work. People are paying students or other people to do the entire online course. So they are giving uh, their login information to another person to do the entire course for them. So be aware, um, get to know your students, just like it's building relationships. The more you know about them, the more respect they have for you, the less likely they'll probably actually violate the honor pledge. There's a lot more information, so I, so I would encourage you, if you feel that you might have a violation uh, in your class, call us. I did leave some brochures if you did not get one over by the sign-in sheet. Um, but I'll open up very quickly to questions for myself or Andy or Jason. Um, yes? Um, I don't know if anybody can answer that question here or who exactly, but we're students as well. And what if we're dealing with a difficult student before we get threatened or something like that during the semester? I mean, I know we probably should talk to a supervisor, but is there like, the and probably probably go mainly under under Andy, but in my case of my situation is that we that's one thing we would work with Andy. Like if you file a report and you feel like you're getting a backlash, that is not appropriate. <laughs> that should not be happening. And so we can use other resources on campus to make sure that you feel comfortable um, where in your work. And so. Yeah, I think anytime we're talking about like feeling threatened. Um, that's a really loaded word, right? So like how we all define threatened can be can be very different. And so give us a call, we can talk through that. Um, sometimes just because you feel that way or there's certain behaviors doesn't mean it necessarily is elevated to like a policy violation where we're pulling like a critical incident response team together or we're doing a code of conduct, but it may be we're going to have a conversation with that student about that behavior or brainstorm with you about how we can do some interactions before we get to that kind of elevated step on my policies. Yes. If it's a threatening student, give us a call. That's gonna be that's gonna be our office. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that brings up a, a scenario. 
because we've been involved with some of our students. Uh, they have autism, Asperger's disorder, or autism spectrum disorders, where communication can be difficult. And I've had a couple students in the past who get flustered. But a good example of how we work together based on that, we had a student a couple years ago in class, it's very hard for him to articulate to the professor, he doesn't talk very well. And the professor was getting emails that were just beautifully written and trying to figure out, okay, this isn't the same and had concerns. Professor contacted us. And this is a student you've been working with, Andy's office as well. Well, I can vouch for the student can sit there and to discuss, has trouble articulating verbally the email. I can have him sit down and say, okay, let's compose that. 10 seconds, beautiful, two, par two paragraph email, beautifully composed. Sometimes that communication comes off in different ways. And so we are working together quite a bit with students and sometimes it's understanding the underlying causes for this, some of that behavior too. If a student feels threatened by another student and the one that feels threatened comes to us, can we file a report on behalf of someone else, like a second hand kind of thing? Okay. Yes, you can. You can fill out that report saying this information came in. I mean, at the end of the day, we're going to need to talk to the student that feels threatened, right? Like that's, we just need some direct information, some direct knowledge to understand the context of what's going on. and. I mean, is it a threat to just that student? Is it a threat to campus? Is it, you know, where did all does this extend? And maybe that report is, oh, we've got that report that this student is threatening this one, but that actually connects to this same person that's threatening this person. Like, we need the information so we actually understand the picture and the context and what we're really dealing with as a campus community so we can respond. Because unfortunately, we do have students and faculty and staff and, um, where we've had issues. Right, but I also think K State has some really good mechanisms in place to respond to those issues. Like I, I feel really good about our, our response system with with kind of safety issues or elevated situations with our with our campus community. If a student shoots and catch catch that and he or and we have agreement. To, you know, we're, gonna, we're not going to report it, but you do get some takeaways and they're great. So what's the risk for the instructors for not reporting that? So the risk for not reporting it is one, are we, one is are we helping our students is the question about are we really, um, because <laughs> this sounds horrible. Students. students aren't always the most honest, and so they might say, this is the only time I've ever done it, please give me a break. Yet then, in their English class they did it, in their psychology class they did it, they can, that's, not all students are that way. Some of them it truly might be the first time they've ever done it, um, and we like to give breaks. But that's the main reason for us to report. There really isn't a risk unless the student, and unfortunately very few students, know their rights. Um, on campus, they don't know that there's this great agreements process because most students aren't going to read the undergraduate or the, the university handbook. Um, so, kind of sounds bad. There's not much of a risk because most students are not going to grieve a grade after the fact. However, if they do grieve a grade and it goes through from the faculty and then to the part department, I mean, there's a strict process. If it is because of an honor and integrity violation or academic integrity violation, it's going to be forced and you're going to be dealing with that longer, much longer after the actual case itself. As for the student, if you're just giving a zero, you're not ending their world at K-State. You're not being kicked out of school. The only thing that's actually on their transcript is if you give them an XF, so the X will be there for that short amount of time before they take the development and interior class, and suspension and expulsion, but you can't do that. That's if they've had multiple violations. So. That's why we have a lot of professors fear that they're going to be ruining the student's career if they report. No, it's, they got a zero, which is what you wanted to give them anyway, but it allows us to make sure I'm able to have an educational conference, educational meeting with them, we send them letters, and then we can know that if that was really the only time they've done it, great, and they're never going to do it again, hopefully. But those who might have done it in the past, we can see that, that trend um, and take appropriate action because that wasn't a one time. So as a professor, not much of a risk, but it's just helping the, the university as a whole uh, is probably the, the benefit. So as an instructor, I, at least for me, I have a reputation. If we need to report, it's going to have a 
<laughs> so so that that is that is one thing that I know and I haven't talked with you about it but I know that in previous with with Jana Fallon who was in position earlier there is a question about what happens if uh, if I report a student and then my T-Vals come back because if you report somebody you get them it gives them an XF so there's some conversations that actually we probably should have that if a student receives an XF in the class they're still on your email list for your T-Vals and so it's like, can we remove them? So there's some conversations that we might still need to have because we know that somebody gave me an XF and I didn't think I deserved it. I might, I might put some rad comments about TVAL too. There, that I didn't learn anything in this class, and TVALs are very important. Just a question on laptop. If you want to stay here, not enough, you have time. You don't really. Yeah. Don't worry about that. But I'm more concerned with the student if he if he does this rapidly, going with whatever and people. So, so the, we cannot share any information unless we have written permission. So it's actually, there's the um, academic records, and we are not part of their official academic records. So when somebody, unless it's on something on the transcript, so unless it's the XF, um, we get called every once in a while by, if somebody's going to law school, they have to mark a check mark box if they had any academic integrity concerns or violations previously, and we might have to explain it. But in most cases, Especially if it's not the XF or suspension or expulsion, nobody's ever going to know about it. Any other questions for any of us? Well, as you can tell, the three of us, we work collaboratively. We're very, three very separate offices, but we do have some overlap. I mean, I've worked with Jason and Andy for years. Um, and so hopefully at least now you have these three resources. Um, you know who to contact when you have these different concerns. And know that, just like Andy said, most of our stuff is a team uh, approach. Um, they all have staff. <laughs> they both have staff. It's me. I'm the Honor and Integrity System. Um, don't even have a graduate student this semester. So, so I'm always reaching out like, okay, yeah, we need to chat. We need to get some other information. Um, but hopefully you found this valuable to at least have that information uh, as, before you're starting this, this coming semester. So, um, so at this point, you now completed your first of the professional events here in spring. Almost. After this event, I'm going to send everyone a post event survey. If you'd like to go to this event for a professional development certificate, I recommend that you complete that survey. And the purpose of today is to say that we have a community that's all in this together to kind of figure out the issues and concerns. And these three wonderful individuals, these three wonderful offices can help us with this. Please join me in thanking them. I think Jason put a little flyer handout as well. So grab one of those if you did not grab one about Student Access Center. Yeah,